If you're watching this video, you probably have a cheap microscope and you probably don't have a fancy C-mount mount with a dedicated microscope camera. Those can run $200 for entry-level versions, and my microscope is 150 has a lifetime warranty, but it's, it's a cheap microscope. And that's why I built this. Now, don't let this scare you. This is the first version, which is, it's ugly. It's scary. Originally, I had made two channels. The way this works, you set your phone here and adjust this shelf. The two channel was ridiculous. I don't know why, but sometimes I can be really stupid. I might be being stupid right now. The new version, which you'll see, is nicer, because everything about it is nicer, and it only has one channel and it's not mangled. So the materials you'll need. But before we even go there, I watched a video. I was getting frustrated trying to hold my, my cell phone. I don't... I knew a lot less than I do now about microscopes, but I had no idea what I was doing. And I was looking for methods of holding a phone, uh, using it as a camera on a microscope. And this young girl stacked a bunch of cups until they got high enough. She put the phone in, found the right angle, and just rested it on the optical tube. And it worked. That's neat. That's definitely an option in a page. I wanted something a bit more lasting and, and a, a dedicated device. So the materials you'll need I use plywood. This is a bit more than 1 8 thick. It's a bit less than 3 16 It's nice plywood. I had it laying around to scrap, so that's what I used. A lot of people aren't going to have plywood laying around. So something that is ubiquitous, that you can find in any office store, Walmart, or dollar store, is a clipboard. This is not cardboard. This is a particle board. And I'm certain this would work. So you could use this for your platform. You could even use cardboard, but you'd have to reinforce it with, uh, say this was a piece of cardboard, you could reinforce it with popsicle sticks. And for your channel, you'd put them parallel, approximately the width of your, a little bit bigger than your bolt, or wider than your bolt, and glue them down, take them, and maybe add a few additional popsicle sticks to provide rigidity to the cardboard. That would be the really cheap way of doing it. There's probably an easier and cheaper way altogether. This is what I thought of, this is what I've come up with. Right. You will need, in my case, a fellow wing nut and a bolt. You'll need your hockey. And you'll need some kind of tube. In my case, I had, I often have a lot of scraps laying around. I had a scrap of steel tube, and I had a whole steel tube. I cut this First with a hacksaw, and then the second version I used a pipe cutter for. The tube, that's probably the biggest difficulty here, is the tube. But you have, uh, I would recommend, if it's close enough, schedule 20 PVC. It's thin, uh, schedule 40 is pretty thick and heavy. But in a pinch, you could even use a toilet paper or paper towel roll. And similarly, with the the popsicle sticks, you could add rigidity to it, or you could simply epoxy it. Now, say this was a toilet paper tube. You would make a straight line, and try to make it straight. Then you would take scissors or a razor knife and cut that. Now, you don't want it to be too small, that won't work but a little bit too big is not a big deal. So you take that now, and you fit it over your microscope optical tube. And you wouldn't want it too tight, because if you, you know, when you remove it, it might yank out your optical lens. You don't want that. You don't want it super loose, but you don't really want any friction there. So you drop that, get it to where it fits, and then tape it. I would use painter's tape for one reason. It's rigid and it's consistent. Duct tape is, it's, it's bendy, it's nasty stuff. Painter's tape would work. And then once you have 
not stabilized and in the right shape, you could epoxy it. And anyone can get a hold of epoxy. You can get two part, one part, or you could use popsicle sticks, whatever you want to do, but it's going to have to be rigid enough to support the weight and whatever backing material you use with your foam on top. So that's pretty much it. That's all we have is a wing nut bolt, backing material, a tube, and then, of course, epoxy. JB Weld has always been my favorite epoxy, and that's what I've used here, JB Weld. It's a two-part epoxy, very simple, equal amounts, you mix it. It takes a long time to cure them, so you have to have some patience. Now, um, one other idea, just for variety, because not everyone wants to do things this way. These are neodymium magnets, Harbor Freight neodymium magnets. Here I have an old handle to a grill spatula. I took off the ugly wood and added a very nice Coca-Cola handle. You drill holes approximately the depth and width of your neodymium magnets. You probably want to add an adhesive if you were really going to do this. I'm not. This is for illustrative purposes. And you'd, set, you'd, you'd inlay your magnets in there. Now watch this. All right, so this is the foam shelf. Now, because most of the time your, your mount or your phone is going to be at an angle, in my case it's about 45 degrees, friction already handles much of the weight, so you don't need anything super tough. But I have, I have very smooth and fine control over how I align the, the phone with where it would be a, a, an optical tube hole. So that's another option. I figured I'd, I'd show you that. It's one of those things that are so simple, they're easy to overlook. But that's it. I'm going to... I'm going to get to it now. So if you're interested, stick around, and we'll go through the basic process. All right. Now that I've cut out the shape that I want, or my phone, and you'll notice that on many phones the camera is offset to one side or the other rather than symmetrically in the center. In this case, my back camera is facing toward the right. So I've made a faint outline of where I'm going to drill the hole. And I'll find the appropriately sized portion of it. Again, it is not necessary that you use this, and I'm pretty sure anyone can get the basic concept. But if you needed to use a standard drill, you could use a drill bit of any size, really, and simply perforate along the inside of the outline, and then break it out and file it. It's certainly quicker with a portion of it. So now that I have this hole, the next step is to, and remember, don't mix up your orientation. The pipe is going to be on the back side. So I'm going to clean this up a bit and epoxy that, but I'm going to wait until the very end, and that takes yeah, six hours to, to really be able to handle it, I think, full cure after about 12 or 16 hours. Now for those going with the channel method, you'll want to you know, grab some kind of something that's going to allow you to make a straight line. And you can overdo this just so you don't have to go back and make more adjustments. All 
All right, so once you have your straight line, you're going to drill once toward the top, and I don't think they make a foam that would be that short, so you really don't need to go nearly that high. But you're also lightening the load by adding this channel or groove. And for maximal compatibility, I would go reasonably far down towards the bottom. And here's another instance of where I have available tools. I have a Dremel, and this is a cutting bit. And what I'll do is I'll just go real easy along that line and keep, keep digging and then cut that channel up. If you don't have a Dremel, which I'm sure most people don't, then you would do the same concept as you might if you didn't have a Forstner bit or you didn't have a bandsaw. You would simply drill and drill and drill and drill and then you'd take a box knife, for example, cut the excess out. And if you really want to be super straight, and depending on how you're doing this, you don't even have to just to drill it. You could score this enough times that you'd be able to open that up. But whatever your method, once you have your channel, you'll take a file or a piece of sandpaper. Anyone can get a hold of a piece of sandpaper. Harbor Freight, uh, various files and rasps, they're, they're really cheap. Um, but if you don't have a file, there are lots of other things you can use. You can take an old butter knife and wrap a piece of 80 grit sandpaper to it and clean this up. But I'm going to go ahead and open this channel and I'll be back in a minute. So I've created the channel groove, whatever you want to call it. You can see here the Dremel wandered and dug into the side there. You can take a file and just drag it through. You can carefully clean it with a box knife if that's what you have available. Be creative, find some, some way to do it. Now once I have that open enough, I'm going to get a flat file in there and open that up a bit. Now, uh, that thing that has disappeared. Uh -huh. So you're going to need it at least as big as your your bolt, at least as wide as your bolt, and it can be a little bit wider because it's going to be secured from the front and the back. I'm going to clean this up, and I'll be right back. Well, it's just after that, the passing of that hurricane balloon, and it's hot as hell, very humid. So I've cleaned this, I've opened the channel wide enough that this bolt slides freely. I could probably do a better job. Now, I will put the shelf in. Side is the flat side. It was a bit too thick, so I thinned it out with a sander. That's it. Now, another way you might be able to do this channel is by using your drill as an outer, going up and down. That can be a bit unwieldy, but you can do it. I'm not going for perfect center. So here it is. Oh, I might 
put some linseed oil on this or whatever, but what you might be wary of is if you use a paint, sometimes it can make it a bit sticky on resistance. You want the slide to be smooth. And that might bring itself in over, over time. So the next step is to epoxy the tube. And then it's pretty much done. So I will end the video with that. And I'm trying to think of various considerations. And I, I think I've covered it. That's pretty simple. I'm sure some, some folks would turn the video off a few minutes through with the general idea already in mind. But if you haven't done it before, this might be helpful. And that's pretty lightweight. The tube is going to be the bulk of the weight, but at least that's resting on the shelf. Now another uh, consideration that I did just remember. If your tube is too big, if it's too small, it's not going to work. But if it's too big, you might consider adding epoxy, uh, little nodules of, of epoxy, and that will balance it out and close it so when you put it on the tube, if we can find something to illustrate this with, If it's too big, you can kind of close, tighten it up a bit, just by a couple of nodules of epoxy. And if you end up putting too much on there, you can sand that down. It's something to work with. But this is close enough that uh, they, uh, some fraction of a degree is off, but it, it works. Okay then, I will resume when the epoxy is cured with the final results and final results. And then I'll take a couple of pictures of some specimens. So it is mostly finished. The epoxy is still curing, so I don't really want to put weight on it and use it quite yet, but it's certainly solid enough to handle. I used my homemade standard beeswax with oil in this case beeswax and cedar oil, and I use that as a finish. And what that does is it kind of protects the wood. You may not even use wood, but I think it it just smoothed things out when you know, I sanded this with, I think, 120. And it's, it's nice and smooth. There's no resistance there. So I'll be able to get fine adjustments. And it slips on just fine. But I did make the tube a little bit too long, so I may have to shorten it, but I think it'll be fine. It's probably a quarter inch too long. We'll see how that works. Now, if you're, if you're still watching, you, you might actually be curious, as ignorant as I am with microscopes. A couple of things that I found very helpful. Obviously, you're going to need microscope slides and slide cutters. Now, I don't have a loose slide cutter, but here is a slide with a slide cutter and a small hibiscus leaf. What I was finding, you see, you can see the, it's just a, the slide cover is a small, very thin, delicate piece of glass and it's square rather than rectangle. The globs you see there are super glue. So what I'll do, and again, the, the air conditioning coming on, breathing, a fan, lots of things can blow the specimen off. A lot of the specimens I've been looking at, I need a 10 times, a 10x jeweler's loop just to see. I can't see them with three times readers. So I'll take that little square, I'll put a very small bead, usually on just two corners, and I will carefully press that down and hold it, trying not to slide it or smear. Hold it for the standard 15 seconds or so with glass, maybe a bit longer is better. And then it's nice and secure, it locks the specimen in and it doesn't move. You can buy 
pre-made adhesive slide covers, but from what I've seen there, you can get 50 slides and 50 covers for around $10. Probably would be closer to the $50 range doing that with the pre made adhesive slide covers. This microscope, as I've mentioned, is, is cheap. It has a halogen bulb, which is a good quality light, but it's hot, uh, hot enough to actually affect a specimen. But not only that, it's bottom only illumination. And with higher magnifications, such as 400, you'll find the objective is so close to the slide, you cannot get an external light source. If it's not built into the microscope, it's not happening. In this case, if I do 400 and I have a specimen that's larger than the aperture, it blocks the bottom light. So for 400, I just can't, can't really do much about that. But for 100, and especially 40, I have a piece of steel here not that you have one of these laying around, but maybe you can find something. So it's ferrous, magnetic. I keep my loop on top of that. This is an ancient string light built to last, although I kind of wish it didn't last because it's a really low quality, very cold LED. But it's, you know, it's snaky, so I can set that on the side and sneak some light in, which really helps me see certain specimens at lower magnification. You can buy an articulating light. Uh, it's kind of a two-piece, and it will rotate um, 180 or so. You can buy one of those for about 20 to get a cheap one, and that, that would work. Tweezers. I usually buy high-quality Japanese tweezers. These are cheap, but I did file them, and I clean them up, so now they're aligned and a little bit sharper than they were. Those can be really helpful. There are some things that are just too small to, to handle. But I do recommend uh, tweezers made in Japan. Uh, Japan has a long history of good quality steel and uh, good quality control in, in general. Now, um, hmm. well, I think that's about it. And anyone who took note of my mentioning of, of strongloids, particularly the variety that's invading Florida to start with, although I suspect eventually it will be in the entire food chain, if you think Cuban tree frogs and snails, you know, Burmese python, nothing's really going to eat that, maybe some crazed human being, but tree frogs and snails are a big part of the, the food chain. I'm not a... Uh, wildlife specialist, but I would imagine that fish, birds, raccoons, a lot of animals, foxes, are eating snails and, and tree frogs. Snakes, certainly. And I think that necessitates that you know, we know that, that angiostrongloids is here. And having those particular species as a big vector I think is it guarantees it's going to spread and it's going to become more more common. I don't know what species my cat had. I think if it was the angiostrongloids, he might still have them. He's tested negative three or four times since, so it, it seems that's been eradicated. But um, yeah, he he did have strongloids, so that's kind of that's something I'm interested in is you know, taking specimens very carefully. <laughs> and analyzing them, and a lot of other stuff as well. But consider that. Consider that the, the infection is in integrated species of the food chain. And that could become a problem. Right now, I, I don't know how prolific it is, but it will only increase. All right, enough of the spooky stuff. I will take a couple of photographs you can see the end results of this. And if you're satisfied with that, you can build one of these yourself. All right. Thanks for watching. Hopefully this has helped at least one person. <laughs>